Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, the co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. You know, throughout the years of filming Wild Kingdom, we were faced with the grim reality of extinction of some animal species. In the 60s and early 70s, animals were negatively impacted by the loss of habitat and the use of a chemical insecticide known as DDT. Today, DDT has been banned in the United States, and we've made great strides to preserve wide open spaces where animals can thrive. Wild Kingdom made a direct impact on modern captive breeding and release programs. We are now seeing a positive comeback for species like this red-tailed hawk. We must all do our part to continue this progress to protect all animals in the Wild Kingdom. So sit back and relax and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom right here on RFD TV. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Mutual of Omaha. Hello, welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. This is a mastodon, a creature who long ago lost the battle of survival and no longer roams the earth. This is little Pierre, three and a half year old chimpanzee, youngest star of the St. Louis Zoo Chimpanzee Show. He and other chimpanzees will continue to survive in zoos. However, chimpanzees in the wild are losing the battle of survival. As a matter of fact, the survival of many animals is being challenged. Fortunately, besides raising animals in zoos, man is meeting this challenge to the survival of our wildlife in many places and in many ways. He's doing it with such strange tools as dirigible-shaped balloons, shotgun shells, blunt arrows, miniature radio transmitters, and amphibian planes of the United States Navy. Probably the oddest tool is an egg with brightly colored wax on the end. The most intriguing of all, however, is the Christmas tree ornament. I first saw one of these used in northern Bechuanaland in the Chobe Game Reserve. Here in the reserve, scientists and conservationists are trying to keep track of the habits and movements of wild elephants with a strange assortment of instruments. A glass ball, an ordinary Christmas ornament, is filled with blue paint. Dr. Elder, an American scientist working on this project, then attaches the ball securely to the tip of an arrow. Game scout Simon Majort looks on while another marking device, a thin wax capsule, is filled. When it is full of blue paint, the capsule is carefully fitted onto the tip of the arrow. The arrows with their marking paint are now ready to be fired. Assisting Dr. Elder is Warden Rob Backus. They soon spot a herd, but the elephants won't stay still. Simon stands guard while Rob follows them into the undergrowth to see if they've been marked before. They haven't. It's Dr. Elder's turn now. It's a hit on the flank. The party moves on to another section. Scientists have divided the reserve into four areas. Blue, red, white, green. Elephants in each area are marked with their area color. That way scientists can easily follow their movements through the reserve. Another unusual marking device is eggshells filled with paint. Throwing eggs at elephants may sound funny, but it's no joke. That tusker's wild. 
Simon prepares for trouble. Rob misses. Again he misses. Dr. Elder makes a note. Rob won't quit. But the elephant does. Bullseye, right on the ear. Time, place, size of animal are recorded. That hit right on top of his head. Knowledge gained from marking this way enables scientists to help elephants win their fight for survival. Tagging elephants with Christmas tree ornaments is exciting business, but slightly erratic. I much prefer the accuracy of a capture gun, which shoots tranquilizing darts. In cooperation with the Army here at Fort Huachuca, the Arizona Game and Fish Department also uses the capture gun. With research biologist Jerry Day, Jim and I are going on a most unusual hunt. A hunt to save Arizona's desert mule deer. Jerry confirms the deer is ripe for our purposes. The rest of our party back at the base camp is alerted. Bob Phillips, working for the Army, will follow with the equipment. We'll be marking deer, but with something much stranger than paint. We must first immobilize him using the gun. Miss. We'll have to follow and hope we can get another shot. Jerry loads the gun with a dart containing a quick-acting, immobilizing drug. It's quite painless. Got him. The dart hit him in the hind leg. The immobilizing drug, succinylcholine, will take effect in about six minutes. Jim radios the Army Game Management Unit that we're ready for the special marking equipment. The drug starts working. He's helpless, but in no pain. We can begin phase one. Jim's handkerchief makes a handy blindfold. When he can't see, he'll be less frightened. The dart comes out easily. And now we're ready for the army equipment. We're going to attach a radio transmitter to the deer so that we can follow his movements. First, he must be banded with a bright red necktie. This will enable conservationists to easily spot him on their survey rounds. Data regarding the deer is noted. A tag and a yellow marker are attached to his ear for specific identification. Now the radio equipment is strapped on power pack on this side. It's light and portable. The whole rig weighs less than three pounds. The pack can supply power for about a year.
Every fall, the majestic Canada geese migrate southward by the thousands. One of their resting points along the Mississippi Flyway is Swan Lake National Refuge near Sumner, Missouri. Flying with the Missouri Department of Conservation, I pass formations of geese traveling southward. Pilot Ralph Hibden points out a flock of Canada's headed for the sanctuary. Then below, I see Swan Lake and thousands of snow geese and blue geese. Canada geese also fill the air. Here at the Swan Lake Refuge, Bob Timmerman and his men of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service have pioneered a novel method of trapping wild geese for scientific study. At the trap site, Bob shows me how it works. The trap consists of a series of red tube-like projectiles attached by ropes to the edge of a capture net. The explosive charge is a shotgun shell with a shot removed that fits into a cannon. There are a dozen of them all together. The projectile slides over the cannon. The explosives are wired so that all 12 cannons will fire simultaneously. They launch the projectiles which carry the net out over the capture area. To lure the geese into the capture area, Bob uses corn. The trap is baited, cannons are loaded. About this time, the geese normally come in to feed. And here they come. We move to the blind. From here, I'll have a good view of the action. Here's the first Canada geese. Now the snows and blues land on the baited area. Here come the Canadas. They're darker and have a distinctive white patch on their black heads. Swan Lake attracts the largest flocks of geese in North America. Sometimes more than 130,000 feed and rest here. Bob is all set. The trap's almost full. The wire from the cannons is connected to the detonator. Ready? Fire! We caught our birds. Now for phase two. Bob calls Carl Slagle. While Carl's on his way here, we'll take a closer look at our catch. They're quite unharmed by their experience. And I can see that this fellow's full of fight. Here's Carl. And now we begin one of the most interesting parts of this conservation program. While I hold the goose steady, Carl slips a yellow band around his neck. That'll help identify. Next, a leg band with capture details. Now for the unusual part. A tiny radio transmitter, weighing only a few ounces, is slipped over the goose's head and strapped to his body. It's specially designed so that it won't interfere with his flying. The transmitter sends out a radio signal with a special frequency. The signal is picked up by this receiver. Carl can then track the bird's movement for conservation studies.
special trailer pen arrives. Biologist Dick Vaught of the Missouri Department of Conservation takes over. The captured birds are loaded into the trailer for transportation to a holding area. At refuge headquarters, Dick Vaught conducts research. The answers he gets here help wild geese face the challenge to their survival. One of the geese we captured earlier is placed in a box. It's a tight squeeze, but we want to make sure he doesn't move. No, we're not going to cook him. That's not an oven. It's part of an x-ray machine. Dick's going to examine our bird to see how much buckshot he's carrying. One in the wing, two in the tail. From these sample tests, conservationists can tell how heavily geese are being hunted. A low shot count means hunting pressure is light. A high count means it's heavy. Authorities can then decide how much hunting should be permitted without endangering our wild goose population. If we're going to help an animal survive, we have to know where he is, where he goes, and how he gets there. A green sea turtle migrates 1,400 miles, swimming through open ocean without landmarks, and yet finds its way to the same tiny strip of land each year. A balloon and a Navy amphibian plane help solve the mystery. This is Tortuguero Beach, Costa Rica last stronghold of the green sea turtle in the Western Caribbean. Here the female green turtle comes onto the beach at night during the summer nesting season to lay her eggs. When she's finished, she covers the nest with sand and returns to the ocean. She has laid her eggs on the only major nesting site remaining in the Caribbean. When the eggs hatch, usually at night, some mysterious instinct guides the hatchlings directly to the water, even though the nest is out of sight of the sea. To learn about the turtle's amazing sea-finding instinct, I visited Dr. Archie Carr at his Caribbean Conservation Project. He believes they respond to some quality of the light over open water. To test this, we put these blinders on a female green turtle to learn if she can find the open sea. If she navigates over land with some sort of compass instinct, blinders won't bother her. But if she only reacts to light over water, she'll be helpless. She heads in the wrong direction, then stops, uncertain. The blinders are removed. She can't see the ocean because her vision is blocked by the surrounding sand dunes. Yet unhesitatingly, she heads directly for the sea. Dr. Carr's theory seems to me to have been proven correct. A balloon filled with helium gas and this float are used in another of Dr. Carr's research projects. No one knows how turtles can navigate hundreds of miles through the open sea from their feeding grounds to nesting places and back. Part of this mystery will be solved when scientists can trace their exact movements. To do this, Dr. Carr and his associates attach the balloon and float to a green sea turtle's shell. 
the shelter that has been protecting it from the hot midday sun is removed and the creature is ready for launching. The balloon will tell us where she goes. One flipper has been tagged. Fishermen returning the tag with details about the capture are rewarded. This is another way Dr. Carr gathers more information on the turtle's movements. With the balloon marking her course, she begins a journey that has no known destination. From a tower, the turtle's movements can be followed and charted by research associate David Ehrenfeld. To save hatchlings from attack by predators, the curiously dented, flexible eggs are dug up from the beach and buried again in a special incubation area. All pertinent information is carefully noted. The covered eggs are then further protected with a wire screen. After about 60 days, the eggs hatch and the hatchlings are placed in a holding tank. The baby turtles are about two inches long. Dr. Carr's Caribbean Conservation Project in cooperation with the National Science Foundation, is helping turtles fight their battle for survival. The United States Navy is also helping in this fight. Three times a year, the hatchlings are carefully placed in shipping boxes. The boxes are securely closed. Then the Navy takes the hatchlings and distributes them on beaches around the Caribbean, hopefully establishing new colonies of green sea turtles, and thus taking another step in meeting their challenge to survival. If man is not successful in fighting the battle for the survival of the natural world, the day may come when a father takes his son to a museum and in front of an exhibit of stuffed chimpanzees, his son might well ask, Daddy, what's a chimpanzee? And the answer might be, Oh, that's an animal that used to be here on Earth a long time ago. I hope the day never comes when we can't observe and enjoy a real live chimpanzee, as cute and intriguing as little Pierre. With the giant strides of scientists and conservationists like the ones we've seen today, and the support of people like yourself, there is hope that generations to come will be able to enjoy the wonders and beauties of the wild kingdom. The company with health insurance for people of all ages has presented Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Like what you saw? Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube for more exclusive content. And visit our website at wildkingdom.com. Mutual of Omaha. Protect your kingdom.